like to thank the society very much for this wonderful award, and, and I'm, I'm very appreciative, and I will try and tell you a little bit about how NanoDisk evolved and how we can use this platform for determining the, the structure and function of membrane proteins. So to start here, um, the NanoDisk is this phospholipid bilayer, roughly 10 nanometers in diameter, that's stabilized by an amphipathic helix, belts, if you will, that wrap around uh, the discoidal structure. These amphipathic helices are nonpolar on the insides against the alkyl chains of the phospholipids, and they're polar on the outside. And the beauty of this system is that you can actually use this as a, a nanometer scale uh, surface of a membrane of defined and controlled composition. More importantly, you can also use the self-assembly process to actually self-assemble membrane proteins into the bilayer where the membrane protein finds itself in its native phospholipid environment, so it's happy, it thinks it's a functional protein, but the entire thing is, is rendered soluble and monodispersed in solution uh, because of this amphipathic belt that wraps around here. And so this, the process, as I'll show you, is a simple self-assembly process where you start off with this amphipathic belt, which we call a membrane scaffold protein, phospholipids, and your favorite target molecule, and then in a self-assembly reaction, you can actually assemble these, your target protein into the bilayer that's in the nanodisc system. Now, nanodiscs are actually lipoprotein particles, and there's a vast literature of lipoprotein particles that goes back decades. Of relevance here is the high-density lipoproteins, the so-called good cholesterol, because they're part of the reverse cholesterol transport system that brings cholesterol and cholesterol esters back to the liver, but also deliver it, delivers it to the steroidogenic tissues for the synthesis of steroid hormones. It's been known for many years, of course, that the main protein component of high-density lipoproteins is called ApoA1. And then from pioneering work very on, early on in the 70s, it was known that there's actually a, a lipid-poor form of the high-density lipoprotein that's not this circulating form of a ball with cholesterol and cholesterol esters all in the interior, but it's actually a lipid-poor form that has a discoidal shape. And a lot of X-ray scattering studies and so on in the, in, the, in the early days actually proved this discoidal form of the uh, lipoprotein particles. We came onto the business sort of in the mid-90s because I had built an atomic force microscope and was looking for things to image. And so one of the things from Anna Jonas, she provided some uh, ApoA1 protein and we tried to reconstitute lipoprotein particles that would be very homogeneous and monodisperse. Unfortunately, when we did that, we got a very large distribution. We published a paper back in the mid-90s that showed that the, the size distribution of these particles was very uh, heterogeneous. And so we had a problem then trying to uh, uh, engineer these in a way that would actually provide monodispersed and very homogeneous type particles. And so that gave us then a bifurcation in this road between atherosclerosis research and receptor uh, incorporation of receptors into bilayers and the biophysics of membrane proteins. To move forward, we needed to understand something about the structure of the protein component as it interacted with the lipid uh, particle. And there were various models. This is a model from Jonas and, and, and Schulten where the, the amphipathic helices are running up and down in the so-called picket fence model uh, of, a, of a lipoprotein particle. And then later, Segrist and colleagues came up with the, the belt model of the protein. And we now know from a variety of, of measurements using prio-EM, NMR structures, and so on, cross-linking, that in fact the belt model is the model that we actually uh, use now, the actual structure of the lipoprotein particle. So to move forward then, we needed to actually begin to genetically engineer the ApoA1 protein to remove those parts of the sequence that were not involved in forming these homogeneous discoidal particles, and also to understand something about the self-assembly process. And so we did that with a synthetic gene that we built, and by the mid-2004, mid I think, we had a a, a sequence that we could actually then reconstitute, and, we, and if we were careful about the stoichiometry of the lipids that were used, we could generate very homogeneous and monodispersed particles, either characterized by electron microscopy, or in this case, counting the phospholipids across the size exclusion column uh, chromatography spectra. More recently, of course, we can prove this in a, in a better way. We have a, a, a Mike Marty, a graduate student in my laboratory, in collaboration with Mike Gross and, and Bob Blankenship at Warshu, been done a lot of mass spectrometry on nanodisc, and you can actually fly the entire nanodisc in a mass spec. And if you look at this carefully over here, you can actually count the number of phospholipids that are in a, a, a homogeneous particle uh, size distribution. And basically, you're looking at a, a nanodisc population that has plus or minus one or two phospholipids. 
So this is now the, the basis of going forward. And so the real beauty here is now that the membrane scaffold protein that encircles this as these belts can be engineered with a variety of different properties. We use the synthetic gene, as I said before. We express this in E. coli, and, and the expression levels are somewhere between a half and a gram per liter. So these are a commodity. They're not really a, a high-cost uh, reagent. And you can change the size of these by adding helices or subtracting helices that give different size particles. And we have a whole variety of different tags that you can put on the scaffold protein. And I'll show you examples of how those are used in, in a couple of minutes. So you can put the Hiss tags on the N terminal, the C terminal. We have biotin tags either genetically encoded on the C terminal or attached to specific cysteine residues that can be engineered into the scaffold protein. We have flag tags on either the N or C terminal. We have targeting um, uh, sequences that I'll show you a little bit about later, whether CMIC or RGD tags, various kinds of oligonucleotide tags that can go on here so you can have a, a, a DNA encoded barcode, if you will, for making arrays and doing high throughput screening, various kinds of magnetic beads I'll show you about in a minute. And we have a variety of different fluorescent uh, uh, nanodisks as well, as well as dark nanodisks where we've engineered to have no tryptophans or even an ultra-dark nanodisk where it has no tyrosines or tryptophans. This is useful from some assay platforms where you want to make use of the incorporated membrane protein target has its own tryptophan or, or, or uh, tyrosine residues that you want to spectroscopically uh, uh, inquire about. Uh, we have Stealth Nanodisc. This is a collaboration with, uh, in Denmark for uh, X-ray and neutron scattering with Lisa Arleth that has ND um, hydrogen deuterium matched the, the nanodisc so it's invisible in neutron scattering, and now you can use this to study your incorporated membrane protein structure. And as I'll show you, we have in the toxin-free nanodisks as well. So the popularity of these nanodisks is sort of illustrated in this, in this graph here. If you just go to SciFinder and you just you know, ask what nanodisk for the title, the number of papers that are published is growing exponentially. We're up here somewhere. This has been possible because we provided the genes for the membrane scaffold protein to the academic community through AdGene. And at last look, there was 1,006 different uh, shipments of the uh, membrane scaffold protein to, to academic labs worldwide. That's provided then, I think, the basis for a lot of the success of nanodisc technology. And I'll tell you, tell you a little bit about not only work from our own laboratory, but some beautiful work that's been done by others uh, using the nanodisc technology in, to reveal the structure and function of membrane proteins. Several companies have also been involved in, in serving as uh, CROs to help the pharmaceutical industry uh, generate nanodiscs for their own particular proprietary targets and so on. So this is a summary of the nanodisc system. We basically use two members of the family we call it the MSP1D1 family for historic reasons. It's about a 10 nanometer diameter particle and one that has three additional 20 tumor helices inserted that is about a 12 nanometer particle. The important thing from this slide to take home is that these guys are really robust little hockey pucks. So you put your membrane protein target in there and they're stable and stop flow. You can lyophilize them, resolubilize them with no trouble, sort them in microfluidic or cell sorter devices, put them on surfaces, and I'll show you many examples of that in a couple seconds about how you can use these as a cassette to bring your favorite membrane protein down to an assay surface, and you can develop a lot of high throughput assays, and I'll show you examples of that in a minute. So the critical thing here is getting your membrane protein into the uh, nanodisc, and there are two main pathways we use for this. If you have a, a purified membrane protein, you can just do a mem mix it with the me uh, membrane scaffold protein and phospholipids and remove the detergent, and then you have a self-assembly process that ensues. And if you have tags and so on, you can go through various chromatography steps, or if you just want to uh, separate based on the physical properties of the incorporated protein, you can separate bare nanodiscs from your incorporated targets in very clean spectra, and you have your favorite membrane protein. This is a cytochrome P450 that we study in our laboratory, and you can do the, use this now as a basis for going forward and studying membrane proteins in this soluble environment. So the, here's a partial rogues gallery of things that we've done in our laboratory with collaborators over the years um, that has showed some of, that kind of illustrates some of the diversity of different membrane proteins that can be incorporated in nanodiscs. GPCRs were an, early, uh, were an early application for us in collaboration with Dan Oprian and Sever Gervich. Um, we put rhodopsin into nanodisc both as a clean monomer as well as a clean dimer and showed, for example, that a single monomer would actually signal in terms of its interaction with transducin and arrestin molecules. 
more complex things have been inserted into nanodisks. This is a collaboration with Jerry Hazelbauer, uh, where we use the trimer of dimers in a bacterial chemotactic receptor. We learned a lot about the molecular recognition events of how multiprotein complexes were actually formed. Big things can also go in nanodisks. We have put the photosynthetic reaction center in nanodisks. There are several papers that have come out with that. Cytochrome oxidase, transhydrogenase, other kinds of large supermolecular complexes will all assemble into a nanodisk structure, usually with the larger disks that we're using for that. This is an example of the SEC translocase that we put in with Frank Duong at UBC. Um, and it turned out to be the basis for then um, Roland Beckman doing the docking of the SEC translocase with a ribosome and actually looking at the structure of ribosomes docked to a translocase in a membrane bilayer. I'll tell you a little bit about toxins and a little bit about blood coagulation. One of the things that's, of course, important is, you know, who pays the rent in your laboratory from NIH? And cytochrome P450 has been a, a favorite uh, um, study of ours for many decades now, and we've used the nanodisc system from mammalian human P450 systems not only to understand the basis for drug-drug interactions and those P450s that are involved in hepatic clearance, but also to trap intermediates that are involved in hormone biosynthesis, where you use the nanodisc to actually insulate the protein against all the physical, pro uh, physical tools you're using um, to reveal those intermediate structures. So then I thought I would give you a little, also an example of several diff rows galleries of applications of nanodisc technology. The first I want to talk about is just sensing and diagnostics. Nanodiscs prevent the target denaturiza denaturation. If you try to take a membrane protein, put it down on a, on a sensor surface, it poisons the surface and so on. You put it in a nanodisc, you can fix it up so that the charge distribution prevents uh, the spoiling of the surface. And over the years, we've done a lot of sensing uh, modalities here. These are mostly with collaborators at Northwestern University, where we use the nanodisc either with localized surface plasmon resonance or surface-enhanced Raman spectroscopy. Uh, we've done a lot of surface plasmon resonance, normal SPR uh, uh, technologies, putting the discs down on surfaces. Here's cantilevers and beams with Dravid at Northwestern University. You can sort them on, as I said, in fluidic devices um, with Chang Lu at Northwestern University or put them on self-assembled monolayers and do mass spectrometry with, with Milan Merchik's here now at Northwestern University. So there's a lot of applications here where you can use this as a platform to enable the, the analysis and assay of, of membrane proteins by a variety of different analytical tools. Structural biology has always been a, an important, uh, important part here, and I'm glad to see Jean Chen in the audience because she supported structural biology and membrane proteins for so long. This has really been an explosion recently, and I wanted to point out particularly the, the, the results of solution and solid state NMR spectroscopy applied to membrane proteins. A whole variety of, of individuals are now using nanodisks in this technology, but I wanted to highlight solid state NMR first done by Chad Rienstra at Illinois, determining the structure of the belt around the, uh, the nanodisk structure as well as structures of uh, important uh, constraints on the structures of membrane proteins inserted here, and also Gerhard Wagner who not only determined the structure of a membrane protein by solution NMR in a nanodisc, also determined the orientation of that membrane protein relative to the bilayer surface, but more recently has advanced another step toward the evolution of this membrane scaffold protein by characterizing beautifully smaller membrane scaffold proteins that allow you to make smaller discs that help in the solution NMR structure determination. I also wanted to sort of um, uh, recognize a, a really exciting and pioneering uh, result that has come out from a Coors laboratory in Canada. I'm going to talk a little bit about RAS and signaling molecules in a few minutes, um, but what I wanted to point out here is a simple uh, NMR structure of RAS on a nanodisc uh, surface, which points out a very important thing. When you're studying membrane proteins that interact with membranes, the membrane can dramatically change and determine the structure of the membrane protein that you're interested in. And we'll come back and talk about that in terms of RAS and the potential for looking at druggable, uh, finding uh, therapeutic interventions in, in RAS signaling. Cell-free synthesis, lots of people have now um, been using nanodisc as the recipient of in vitro translation systems that put membrane proteins into nanodisc. There was initial hiccups a few years ago, but now I think it's becoming pretty uh, routine to do this. Lots of examples of hydrogen exchange kinetics here. I didn't list all of them there. And even in crystallography, because people always ask, can you crystallize membrane proteins in nanodisc? There's a paper coming out where it shows that, in fact, you can do that. That was with bacteria rhodopsin. 
more importantly, or at least ex equally exciting, I think, is the explosion in electron microscopy uh, using nanodisc to study the structure of membrane proteins. Mark Fisher, a former graduate student of mine in laboratories, co uh, collaborated with John Collier at, at Gogol uh, to look at, at toxins inserted into nanodisc structures, a couple of papers, one very recently here um, looking at that. There was a beautiful structure of the rheodine receptor in nanodisc that came out um, just a few months ago. Um, and we've been involved with, with Subramania at NIH, um, looking not only at P450 structures in nanodisc, but also as RAS. And I'll show you some examples of uh, some work that we've done with integrin structure uh, using cryo-electron microscopy as well. The fact that these membrane scaffold proteins evolved from basically a human APOA1 sequence uh, gives us the opportunity to take advantage of the immunogenically neutral uh, aspect of those structures. And so we've had nanodisks in animals. They can, can measure their clearance rate, their tissue distribution, and so on. But importantly, they can be used to deliver peptides, lipids, proteins, and even nucleic acid, as shown by Alnylam some years ago, uh, in, in vivo sort of delivery mechanism. And this is an example that we, we had uh, published a couple of years ago with Dennis Volker in, in uh, Denver where you can actually deliver a therapeutic lipid, in this case it's POPG, and you can protect against respiratory viral infections and also inhibit then the inflammatory response that's called, caused by lipopolysaccharides interacting with toll-like receptor-mediated uh, uh, actions. So you can do these guys in vivo as well. More recently, we've been collaborating with Tom Mead uh, to use the NanoDisc platform in a multimodal uh, um, uh, faction, uh, faction. Uh, either by uh, targeting this, by adding targeting agents onto the scaffold protein, fluorescence labels to do a, a dual labeling, or magnetic resonance contrast agents. And in this case, we can load over 100 gadolinium chelates into a nanodisc and get a contrast enhancement that's far better than you can normally say. And again, the, the homogeneity and the small size of this allows it for vascular imaging and, and cellular targeting. Another aspect of the, of the nanodisc is the ability to control the actual composition of the bilayer surface. This means you can make a variety of different uh, uh, reconstitutions that have different percentage of anionic lipids. And in many biological systems, anionic lipids seem to be a factor in the recruitment of membrane proteins to a membrane surface. And we'll see more examples of that uh, in a few minutes. Collaborating with Jim Morrissey at Illinois, we've been able to sort of look at blood coagulation complexes where, in fact, tissue factor is an integral membrane protein is, is uh, assembled into nanodisks, and then one can separate out the recruitment-free energies uh, for various blood coagulation factors like factor 7 or factor 10, either through protein-protein interactions or through uh, the uh, electrostatic interactions that are mediated between anionic lipids and bridged, bridging calciums uh, and these blood co uh, coagulation factors. The assay here is, again, you can just do normal surface plasmon resonance. This is a, a factor 10 binding isotherm and looking at the free energy differences as you make nanodisks with different percentages of anionic lipid content. More complex are the uh, signaling pathways. And this is a very exciting, uh, um, currently on, um, ongoing work in our laboratory. I want to give you two examples of that. One is in the integrin signaling uh, pathway. And the important thing to remember here is that all these signaling pathways, again, are, are supramolecular complexes that are composed of multiple, com multiple partners, all interacting at a membrane surface. So many years ago, we collaborated with Mark, Mark Ginsburg and, and um, Taylor at Florida to actually show the first example of an inside-out signaling event where Talon would bind to the inside part of the bilayer and change the conformation of the integrins. This was by cryo-EM. We've continued to interact with Mark here at, at UCSD and a variety of other systems in terms of, and, and looking at assay systems that actually now allow you to document the, the contributions of electrostatics and the association of these, uh, um, these uh, signaling molecules with the membrane surface, as well as specificity of head group interactions with specific phospholipids. So the assay here is a fret-based assay, so you put a donor molecule on, your, on the belt around the nanodisc an acceptor molecule on your, uh, on your membrane protein. In this case, it's the tail and head domain. And you can do very nice assays as a function of the lipid composition that changes the, the, the uh, charge, distant, charge uh, content of the nanodisc. To unravel this in terms of head group specificity and total charge, you have to actually make some kind of measurement 
of the total formal bilayer charge. And this, this is actually a very complex axis here. Um, with Tom Lowey, uh, we were able to actually use membrane-confined electrophoresis to determine the, the actual charge on a nanodisc because when you start putting charges into these 10 nanometer spaces, you have a polyelectrolyte. And so you need to actually be able to measure the actual charge on there. When we do that, we could actually then quantitate, for example, the binding of the tail and head domain in terms of free energy and separate out the components that are due to electrostatic versus those that are, in, that are actually contributing also from a gr uh, head group specificity, in this case, sugar molecules on, the, on PIP4 or PIP2. A more complex even system is the RAS signaling pathway, and this is an, a, a currently ongoing project in our laboratory that's occupying a lot of, of, a lot of efforts. Um, you have a complex system of signaling that you all know about, where in fact you growth factors and so on interact with receptor tyrosine kinases. But then there is a real cadre of membrane proteins or membrane anchored proteins that actually interact then on a membrane surface to give rise to complex signaling events. When people try and study these molecules in the absence of a membrane, you come up with some erroneous conclusions or at least some misleading guidance sometimes because, in fact, if you're not on the membrane surface, then, in fact, you're missing an important component that's, that's forming these supramolecular component, uh, complexes. And so that gave rise to the concept that RAS was undruggable. Okay? Recent work, though, makes use of another assay system that we developed in our laboratory that's label-free where you actually put a long lifetime fluorophore on the nanodisc, and if you go to frequency domain fluorescence spectroscopy, you can actually quantitate the, the rotational correlation time and the slowing of this whole nanodisc complex, even when only a 28 kilodalton small molecule like KRAS4B is binding. In this case, it's the fully processed KRAS4B, so it's farnesylated and has a methyl group, and it's anchoring into the bilayer structure and we can separate out the role of the anchor domain and electrostatic interactions um, as you change then, for example, the, ionic the anionic content of the lipid bilayer surface. This then gives us an opportunity, I think, to unravel the basic uh, molecular uh, biophysics of interactions of macromolecular complexes on membrane surfaces. As a final example, I wanted to tell you a little bit about um, how we can use this as a library to generate uh, membrane protein libraries. And I, I chose this slide because I wanted to make this a, a, Yale, uh, a Yale session here. This is the Beinecke Rare Book Library uh, at Yale, where I started my academic career. Um, and so what I really wanted to point out here is that in many times, you know, we are looking at cell-cell communications or cell-viral communications. You have protein-protein interactions, and you oftentimes don't know who's interacting with who across these interfaces. And so we developed a technology which allows us to generate a faithful library that rep that mimics the membrane protein content and, content and the starting membrane. We call this a soluble membrane protein library. And this has been done in collaboration with um, Bill Klein at Northwestern University again. And so in this case, what we do is we solubilize the, uh, membrane, the starting membrane, uh, and we actually reconstitute into, into nanodisks such that it, the starting membrane library composition, one membrane protein goes into individual nanodisc, and then we, as I'll show you, we can sort this or assay it for things binding to this particular library. And so once we get that library, we can do a lot of mass spectrometry, and this is an earlier paper that came out with Mike Marty from my laboratory where we actually could show that you can indeed res resolve the, re the mass spectra of a GPCR or other proteins that are incorporated in that. Mike has gone on to do a postdoc with Carol Robinson at Oxford and now can fly the entire library onto, on a mass spec and determine the, the composition of the membrane proteins that are in that library. As a specific example, we looked at a, 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 to attack a hypothesis that Bill Klein put forward many years ago that Alzheimer's disease was actually mediated by A-beta oligomers interacting with a specific receptor in the synaptic junction. So to assay that, what we do is we actually put a magnetic bead on the, on the belt of the nanodisc we have an antibody from Bill that's re re that recognizes the A-beta oligomers. We generate the soluble membrane protein library, and then we can do a double pull-down and isolate pieces that are in that library. When you do that experiment, you can actually assay the entire library as, as A-beta oligomers bind to that library. You can first show that everything in the library is there that you can assay. We assayed a bunch of them over here, but the key proteins are in there. You can assay the, the binding of A-beta ligaments to the entire li library and generate an assay to that, or you can do that double pull-down and isolate potential targets for the, uh, for the nanodisc system. 
an assay here using the assay against the total library is just a, is just a, 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 a alpha screen assay where you can actually use diffusible single oxygen. In this case, you have an acceptor molecule tied to the belt. You have a donor molecule tied to your abiotic oligomer, and you can identify compounds as you screen this, this soluble membrane protein library uh, and against a small molecule library and find compounds that will actually go back in vivo and actually inhibit abiotic oligomer binding uh, to synaptic spines. And as a final example, just one slide, let me just point out that this is something very exciting and very new to us. If you think about it, you want to have a membrane protein that raises an antibody response. You want to have the right conformation of your membrane protein. So a paper that just came out with our collaborators here at Scripps, um, you can actually put the HIV um, transmembrane domains in there, and the, in the nanodisc system, it actually allows you to have an epitaxial presentation of the faithful antigenic uh, site that's there. And there are several other examples that have come out recently, starting with a company I formed many years ago um, that actually showed that you can actually get um, neutralizing antibody response. So I've, I see the lights blinking, so I want to finish. Um, I want to thank everybody for contributing all of this work. As I said earlier, uh, the explosion of nanodisc technology is, is not just from my laboratory, but a laboratory really of thousands that are now using this technology. I particularly want to thank NIH uh, for continuing funding our laboratory over these years. And also wanted to point out one thing about the advantage of academic research. It's not really what you do as a professor, but it's what your students that you come through your laboratory ultimately end up doing. And Dave Heinbrick is now the, the director of the Frederick National Laboratory for Cancer Research and got us back into RAS. He was my first graduate student, actually, at, at Yale many years ago. Other uh, acknowledgments uh, I, I'll just list here on the slide. And, and here's my current research group at, at Illinois. So I thank you for your attention and be happy to answer any questions if there's a question and answer period.